Okay, guys, let's get started. Uh, again, thank you, DJ Drop Tables, for always, always, always keeping it down. Um, how's your mixtape going? Uh, it's going. Been recording it. Uh, we'll release it at the end of uh, semester, hopefully. Okay, and it's all it's all like DJ Drop Table beats. Uh, Just nothing but you and like your own stuff. Uh, no, it's all other people's stuff. It's everything. everything. Yeah, it's everything. Okay. It's everything. Okay. All right, uh, so let's get started. It's a beautiful day out, and I think that's why the, um, the, the turnout here is so low, which sucks, because I mean, every lecture is an awesome lecture, but this one I like a lot, too. Uh, the, before we get into the course material, just to discuss real quickly what's on the, again, the schedule for you guys. Project 1 is due this Friday at, at midnight. And again, you should submit that on Gradescope. Homework 2 is due on Monday at midnight, also submitted on Gradescope. So we'll send an announcement out on Piazza, but we've updated the PDF uh, so that you can drop the pictures in right into the, the PDF. So you should be submitting that. No. So we give you a template for draw.io. So it's an online tool to go quickly edit and modify the templates for your answers. So there should be no handwritten drawings and no photographs of like drawings. Everything should be done digitally. And then we'll be releasing project two uh, on, on this Monday as well. And that'll be due, um, I think, two or three weeks in, in October. Okay? So any high level questions about the project or, or homework too? Okay. So let's get into this. So the thing we need to talk about now is that we spent the last three classes talking about data structures. We spent a day on hash tables and spent two days on B plus trees, radix trees, and other tree data structures. So for the most part, during this entire conversation, when we talk about these, these data structures, We've assumed that the that they were only being accessed by a single thread. Uh, there was only one thread that could be reading and writing data to the data structure at a time, and that simplified the, discu the discussion so that you just understand what's the core essence of how these data structures work. But in a real system, we obviously don't want to just have a single thread be you know only accessing the data structure at a time. We want to allow multiple threads because on modern CPUs, there's a lot of CPU cores. So therefore, we can have multiple threads running queries and all updating our data structures. We're also going to allow this to hide disk stalls due to, uh, you know, or stalls due to having to go read, read things from disk because now if one thread is doing something and it reads a page that's not in memory, it has to get stalled while the buffer pool manager brings that in. And then we can let other threads keep running at the same time. So we're going to have a lot of threads running in our system and we do this because that maximizes parallelism or maximizes the, reduces the latency for the, for the queries we want to execute. So for today, we're now talking about it. Now we bring back multiple threads and want to update and access our data structure. What do we need to do to protect ourselves? So I'll just say as a quick aside, so everything that we'll talk about today is what, how most database systems actually work. Most database systems that support multiple threads will do the things that we're talking about today, doing this latching stuff. There are some particular systems that actually don't do any of this uh, and only allow single threads to still access the data structures, and they still get really good performance. Uh, so VoltDB and Redis are probably the two most famous ones that do this. So in case of Redis, Redis only runs in, in one thread, and it's a one-threaded engine. In VoltDB, it's a multi-threaded engine, but they partition the database in such a way that every B plus tree can only be accessed by a single thread. So you avoid all this latching stuff that we're talking about today, and you get really great performance, but obviously this means that it complicates scaling up to multiple cores or multiple machines. Again, we'll talk, about this, we'll talk about these things later on in the semester, but the main idea now is that everybody pretty much does the thing, things that we're talking about. So the way we're going to protect our data structures is through a concurrent control protocol, a concurrent control scheme. And this is just the, the method in which the database system guarantees the correctness of the, of the data structure by enforcing all the threads to access the data structure in, in, using a certain protocol or a certain, certain way. And so I'm putting the, the word correct in quotes because that can mean, a bunch, can mean different things. And the kind of things we're talking about they're accessing, although we've been focusing on data structures, but it really could be for any sort of shared object in the system. Right? It could be for a tuple, it could be for an index, it could be for the page table in, in the buffer pool. It doesn't matter. So the two types of correctness we care about with, in concurrent control are logical correctness and physical correctness. So logical correctness would be like a high level thing that says, if I'm accessing the data structure, am I seeing the values or am I, am I seeing the things that I expect to see? So if I have a, a B plus tree index, I insert the key five in my thread. If that thread comes back and reads key five right away, 
it should see it, right? Should not get a you know, should not get a false negative. Right? That's a logical correctness thing that I'm seeing the things I that I expect to see. The thing that we're going to care about in this class is physical correctness. The how do we protect the internal representation of the data structure? Or how it maintains pointers and, and references to other pages and, and keys and values? How do we make sure that as threads are reading and writing this data, that the integrity of the data structure is sound? So an example would be, we, we don't want the case where we're falling down, traversing to the B plus tree, and when we jump to the next node, we have a pointer to that, and then by the time we read the pointer, figure out where we need to go, and then, and then try to jump there, somebody else modifies the data structure where now that pointer is pointing to a, uh, an invalid memory location, and we would get a seg fault. So this is what we're trying to do today. We're trying to protect the internal data structure to allow multiple threads read and write to it, and that they still, uh, the, the data structure is, is is behaving correctly. For the logical correctness, we'll worry about this more when we talk about uh, transactions and currency control. Right? This is a whole other inter super interesting topic. But for today, we say, you know, how can we make sure that the, the, the data structures are thread safe? So we'll begin by talking about what is actually a latch, go a bit more detail than, we've, than we talked about so far, and how it's actually implemented. And then we'll start off with an easy case of actually doing uh, thread safe hash tables, using latches for those, because they're actually really simple to do. But then we'll spend most of our time talking about how to handle this in B plus trees, and we'll talk about how to do leaf node scans and other optimizations, again, when, when we have multiple threads accessing things at the same time. Okay? All right, so I showed this la slide last time, uh, and I don't think everyone, you know, we only talked about it very briefly, and I don't think everyone absorbed it, so I want to spend more time talking about the difference between locks and latches. So in the database world, you know, where I live, uh, a lock is a higher level concept that protects the logical contents of a database. So a logical content would be like a tuple, or a, a, a set of tuples, or a table, or a database. And we're having, using these locks to protect these logical objects from other transactions that are running at the same time. Like if I'm modifying something uh, in a transaction, and someone, I don't want anybody else to modify that, that tuple at the same time that I am. Right? You may, for other reasons, but for, for our purposes, assume that we don't want that to happen. So for these locks, we're going to hold them for the, the, the entire duration of the transaction. Again, that's not entirely true, but again, for our purposes, just assume that's the case. And then we need to be able to roll back any changes we make to, our, to the objects we modify if we hold the locks for them. So if I'm trying to transfer money from my account to her account, if I take the money out of my account and then I crash, uh, before I put the money in her account, when I come back, I want to reverse that change I made to my tuple. So, these, so it, that means the data system is responsible for knowing how to roll back these changes. So notice up here, I didn't say anything about threads. Right? I'm talking about transactions. So a single transaction could be, could be broken across multiple threads, and they could all be updating the same tuple. That's okay, that's allowed, because the transaction holds the lock. It doesn't matter what thread that, that's actually doing the modification. Where we get now into the low-level constructs that we care about, but again, we're protecting the physical, uh, the physical integrity of our data structures or the objects, is latches. So in the operating system world, they, this is what they call locks or mutexes. In our world, there's latches because we need to distinguish them from locks. So latches are going to protect the critical sections of the database system's internal data structures from other threads that are reading and writing to that data structure or that object at the same time. So we're only holding the latch for a short period, just for the duration that we're in the critical section to do whatever operation that we need to do. I want to update a page, I hold the latch on that page, make the change, and then release, release the latch. We don't need to be able to roll back any changes here because the, op the operations we're trying to do are essentially meant to be atomic. So I, hold, I grab the latch on something, I make whatever change I want, and then when I, when I release the latch, or, or, then the operation is considered done. So all the changes are, are there. If I can't acquire the latch, then I'm not going to do the operation anyway, so there's nothing to roll back. So another way to think about this is, is this great table from the, that, that B plus G book I recommended a few lectures ago from Gertz Graffy. He has this nice table that lays out, again, the distinction between locks and latches. So for locks, we're going to separate user transactions from each other and they're going to be protecting the, the database contents, tuples, tables, things like that, and we're going to hold them for the entire duration of the transaction. There's going to be a bunch of different lock types that we can ha hold on these objects. Again, we'll cover this in a few more lectures. Um, and then when it comes time to actually dealing with deadlocks, 
we're going to rely on some external coordinator, a lock manager or transaction manager to resolve any deadlocks that, that could occur. And the methods we can use are waits for timeouts, aborts, and other things. Again, we'll, we'll focus on these later. What we care about is over here. We have these latches that are going to protect threads from each other for our in-memory data structures. Uh, we're going to protect the critical sections inside these data structures. There's only going to be two lock modes, read and write. Uh, and the way we're going to avoid deadlocks is through us being good, good programmers, which is nice for databases. Good equals expensive, right? So it's up for us to make sure that we write high quality code in our data structures to avoid deadlocks because there is no external thing like a transaction manager or lock manager that's going to rescue us if we have a deadlock. It's up for us to, us to design and implement our data structure in such a way that deadlocks cannot occur. And we'll see what that looks like later on. So again, our focus is on here. We'll discuss all this lock stuff in, in lecture 17 a, after the midterm. Um, again, I find all this super fascinating, but this, this, is, this, is like, this is like one of the, the, the black arts of database systems, if you can you know, actually make this stuff work. All right, so let's talk about the latch modes for, 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 for the, that we can have. Again, there's only two modes, read and write. So a latch, if a latch is being held in read mode, then multiple threads are allowed to, to share that read latch. Right? Because, again, it's a read-only operation, so I can have multiple threads read the data structure at the same time. There's no conflict. There's no integrity issues that could occur. So they can all share, share that. If I take a, the, the latch in write mode, then I can only, that's an exclusive latch, only one thread can hold that latch in that mode at a time. So if I hold the right latch, I'm making changes, nobody else can read that object that I'm protecting until I finish. Right? That's the, the only two modes we care about. Think of this as like, again, multiple threads can share this one. This is, this is an exclusive latch. All right, so let's talk actually how you implement a latch in, in a real system. So the first approach is, is probably the one you're most familiar with. Uh, you know, when you take any kind of systems course or operating systems course, is a blocking operating system mutex, a blocking OS mutex. So this is the simplest thing to use because it's sort of built into the language. Like, like in C++, the standard template library has this thing, std mutex, and it's really simple to use. You just declare it, then you call lock, do something what, you know, on, your, on the object you're protecting with it, and then you call unlock, and you're done. All right? So does anybody know how this actually works in the operating system? In, at least in Linux. How does a mutex like this work? Yes? Okay. He says futex. What is a futex? <laughs> What's that? It's just a memory, a special memory. He said, well, so he said futex. He's correct in Linux. Futex stands for fast user space mutex. The way it works is that there is in user space, in, in the address space of your process, there'll be a memory location that has, you know, like a, like a bit, or it's usually a byte or so. But it'll have a memory location that you can then try to do a compare and swap on to, to acquire that, that latch. But, but then what happens is if you don't acquire it, then you fall back to the, the slower default mutex where that goes down into the operating system. So the idea is you do a quick compare and swap in, in user space. If you acquire it, you're done. If you don't acquire it, then you fall down to the OS, which is going to be slower. Because what happens is if you go down to the OS and sit on a mutex inside side of the kernel, then the OS says, aha, well, I know you're, you're blocked on this mutex. You can't get it. So let me tell the scheduler to, to deschedule you so you don't actually run. And the reason why this is expensive is because now the OS has its own internal data structures that is protecting with latches. So you got to go update now the scheduling table to say this, this process or this thread can't run yet. So he's correct. Fast user space mutex is, is, will be fast because that's just a spin, spin latch we'll talk about in the next slide. But if you fall down to the OS, then, then, then you're screwed. So this is another good example where like, we were trying to avoid the OS as much as possible. For the first project, you guys use this because it's fine. But if, if you have a high contention system, then everybody's going down to the OS, and that's, that's going to be problematic. So the alternative is to implement ourselves using a spin latch or test and set spin latch. So this is extremely, extremely efficient. It's super fast because on modern CPUs, there's a single instruction. There's an instruction to do a single compare and swap on a, on a memory address. I think it's just like, I check to see whether the value of this memory address is what I think it is. And if it is, then I'm allowed to change it to my new value. So think of like the latch is set to zero. I check to see whether it's zero. And if it is, then I set it to one. And that means I've, I've acquired the latch. And you can do that in a modern CPU in a single, single instruction. Right? You don't have to have, you don't have to write C code like if this, then that. 
it all it does it all for you. So the way you would implement this is in C++ is that you have this atomic keyword, which is templated. You can put whatever you want in there, but they have a shortcut for you called atomic flag, which is just an alias for atomic bool. And so inside this, now we, when, when we want to acquire this latch, we have to have this while loop that says, test and set the latch. If I acquire it, then I jump out of the, the, the while loop because I, you know, I hold the latch. If I don't fall into the while loop, and now we have to have some logic to figure out what should we do. The simplest thing is just to say, all right, let me just retry again, loop back around and keep trying it. Right? The problem with that is, though, that's just me burning out your CPU. You know, you're not burning out literally, but like, you're just burning cycles in your CPU because you just keep trying to test and set, test and set, test and set, and it's always going to fail, and you just keep spinning around in this infinite loop. So the, so the OS thinks you're actually doing useful work because it doesn't know what instructions you're executing. So it says you keep executing instructions, let me keep scheduling you, and you're, you're just spike the CPU. So this, this test and set thing is the same thing he said before about the fast user mutex. This is the same thing the OS provides you in the Linux standard, or the SCD mutex on Linux. But maybe I don't want to burn my, my cycles, but just keep retrying. Maybe I want to yield back to the OS, get descheduled, and let, let it schedule some other thread. Or maybe I try a thousand times, and I'm, saying, I'm, I'm not going to get this, and I just abort. So this is a good example of where we, as the database systems developers, we can be smart, or, or we, can, we can tune the, our implementation of how we're using latches in our data structures to be mindful or try to accommodate what we think the workload is going to look like. If I think that this latch is going to be, like, whatever the operation I'm doing, the latch is going to be super fast, then it's probably faster for me to just keep retrying because whoever holds the latch will give it up real quickly. But if I think the operation is going to be super long, then maybe I want to yield or, uh, for some amount of time or eventually abort. We can't do this in the blocking OS mutex. As soon as we try to get it, we can't get it, the OS takes over and we're blocked. Yes? So those parameters, are, are those just some flags? Or? The question is, what, what is this? The parameters there, that's pretty dumb. Th this? Like, test and set. Oh, this? Yeah. yeah, like, the parameters would be, like, it's compare and swap. It says, at this memory address, check to see whether the value is this, like, pass in a zero. If it, if it equals zero, then set it to one, right? And then there, there's, different, there's different APIs. Sometimes you'll get back the old value. You'll get back a true whether it succeeded. There's a bunch of different things. And then they have, they have tests and sets for, you know, for all the different uh, types you could, you could be based on. So again, the main takeaway here is that, again, we, we in the database system can do a better job than the OS because we would know in what context we'd, we'd be using this latch. So for these two examples, though, the latch has, has just been, you know, do I hold it or not? But as I said before, we have, we have different modes, so we need a reader-writer latch uh, that can support uh, these different modes. And so the way we basically do this is we build on top of whatever our basic latching primitive we have, either the spin latch or the, the OS mutex, and then we manage different queues to keep track of how many threads are, are waiting to acquire the different types of latches. Right? So I just maybe just maintain some counters to say, here's the number of threads that hold the latch in, in this mode, and here's the number of threads that are waiting for it. So if a read thread shows up and says, I want to get the read latch, well, I look over here and say, nobody, nobody holds the right latch, and nobody is waiting for it, so I go ahead and, and hand it out, and I update my counter to say, I have one, one thread that, that's, uh, that holds this latch. Another thread comes along, it wants to also acquire the read latch. Again, read latches are compatible, or they can be shared, so we can just recognize that this guy already holds the read latch, so this guy can also acquire it, and we just update our counter. So now the writer, writer thread comes along, wants the write latch, it has to stall because the, because the read latch is being held by, by other threads. And so we just add our counter here to say that we're waiting for this. So now, if a read thread comes along and wants the read latch, what should happen? I mean, it depends upon uh, what policy we are using. Right. So he says it depends on what policy we're using. We could just immediately let the, say, oh, well, the read latch is already, be, is already being held. Go ahead and also acquire it. But that could lead to starvation because the right, the right thread will never get to it. So in this example here, we could just stall it, add it to the, our counter and say, we're waiting for this. And then eventually when the first two guys release the latches, the writer thread will get the latch. Again, this depends, what policy we want to use depends on in what context we, the, the latch is, is, is being used. Right? If, it's a, if, it's a, if it's a data structure where there's not many rights, but the rights are really important, 
then we want to uh, give higher priority to the writer threads. Okay? And again, we just build on top of our, uh, the data structures that, or the, 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 the latching primitives that I showed before to implement something like this. And you can still do this, you can still, depending on how you organize the memory, you can still do this, uh, most of the operations on this atomically. Okay? All right, so let's now see how we take these latches and actually do something with them. So the first thing, as, as I said, we'll first talk about doing hash tables because this is actually super easy to do. And the reason why it's super easy to do is because the ways in which threads can interact with our hash table is, is limited. Meaning we, we probe into a, for this one, assuming we're doing like the static hashing table, the extendable and linear stuff, the dynamic ones, they're a bit more complicated, but the, the, the same principles apply here. But say in the linear probing hashing table, my key shows up, I just hash it, I jump to some slot, and then I just scan down in sequential order on the hash table, try to find the thing I'm looking for, what I'm looking for. And everybody, every other thread is doing the same thing. They're always scanning top to bottom. Eventually you reach the bottom and loop back around, but you think of that as just a circular buffer where you're essentially always scanning down. So in this case here, deadlocks aren't possible because everybody is going in the same direction. Nobody's coming up in the other way and they hold a latch that I, that I want and it holds a latch that I want. Like you can't, you can't have a deadlock. So this makes it super, super simple. So for now, to resize the, pay, the table, this one we just take a global latch on the, on, usually in the header page, that just prevents anybody else from, from reading and writing the, the, the table until I complete the, the resizing. But again, that's, if we size our table large enough to, in the very beginning, like this is a rare occurrence. Most of the time we're just doing you know, probes or, or insertions and that'll be fast. Deletions also complicate this too if you want to do compaction or move data around, but for that we, we can just ignore. So the two approaches to do this uh, will differ on the, on the granularity of the latches. So the first approach you just have at a, on each page you just have a, a single reader writer latch. And so when a thread wants to do something, you know, do, do a lookup, before it can read the page or access it, it has to acquire the right latch uh, for that page. The other approach is to be more fine-grained latching where you have a latch for every single slot. So that means as you're scanning down, you can you acquire the next slot's latch and then you can go into it and then do look for whatever, whatever you're looking for. So there's this trade-off between the computational and the storage overhead between these two approaches. Because the, the page latch, we have to store less latches, there's only one per page, but now this can potentially reduce our parallelism because I can't have two, you know, uh, even though two threads might be operating at different slots, because it's in the same page, they can't run at the same time. In the case of having a latch per slot, it's gonna allow for more parallelism because the, the latches are more fine-grained, but now I'm storing more latches in every single slot, and now it's also more expensive to, you know, to keep acquiring all these latches uh, as I'm scanning through, because I'm doing it for every single slot that I'm looking at. So let's, let's look at some high-level example. So the first one would be page latches. So again, say we have a, a simple, three-page three table that has uh, two slots per page. And so the first thread wants to find D, and say D hashes to this, this position here, this slot. So before I can go look inside of it to see whether the thing I want is there, I first have to get the read latch on it. And then once I have that, now my cursor can start looking at it. Now let's say another thread comes along and they want to insert E, and E wants to hash to where C is. Can it do that? Can it actually start looking at it? No, right? Because, because it wants to take a right latch on this page because it doesn't know that C is, is full. It doesn't know it's gonna have to scan. But so before it can even look at it, it needs the right latch. The right latch is not compatible with the read latch. So it has to stall and wait. So the first guy scans down, he looks at C, and now he needs to go look at this next page here. And again, the way we figure out what page to look at is we just look, you know, we look in our, uh, the header for the hash table and the header is gonna say, here's all the pages that you're looking for. But logically they're ordered sequentially, right? So like page zero, page one, page two. So you look in the header and say, where do I find page two for my hash table? And so in order to do the traversal, when I want to go from, from page one to page two, I actually don't need to hold the latch on one in order for me to jump down to two. Because my, my hash table is static, I'm not resizing, so this location is always gonna be the same. 
So I can immediately release the latch before I jump to this and allow anybody else to keep running. And then I can go ahead and acquire the latch for this. This is gonna be different when we talk about B plus trees. B plus trees, you have to hold the latch on whatever node you're coming from before you jump to the next node. And it's only when you get to the next node do you, do you then release the one behind you. Yes? So whenever like, um, the second thread goes to access, can it obtain a read latch to read through and figure out maybe it doesn't even need to look at one yet and can jump the two and skip over the yeah. other? So he's talking, so he proposed an optimization where, in this case here, for thread, thread two, instead of trying to require, require a write latch, could I just require a read latch, figure out whether the thing I actually want would be there or not, uh, and then if it is, then I go back and try to acquire the write latch, or I just jump down here and say, uh, you know, do the same thing, because I know the thing I'm looking for is not here. If there's no deletes and no movement, yes. Uh, we'll talk, the same technique will be applied for B plus trees, I'm doing it the sort of the, the naive way, but yes, you can absolutely do that. In general, you don't do you you don't really do latch upgrades. You can't say I'm in read mode now, put me in write mode. You release the latch and then in one mode and put and get acquired again in another 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 mode. All right, so this guy has the read latch. He can start reading this. Now this guy gets the write latch. Uh, it, it sees it sees not what it wants, so it wants to scan down here. And this time T1 has gone away, so it can go ahead and do the write latch. See that the thing there's, this slot's occupied come down here and do the insert. Again, it's more coarse grain because only one thread can be inside uh, if they're doing, uh, if, they, if the, the latch modes conflict, there's only one thread at a time could be inside the, the table, uh, but it makes it more simple to actually acquire these latches. I don't, I'm not acquiring latches every single one. So let's, let's see how to do it in, uh, with slot latches. So again, T1 starts, it wants to do uh, find D, it hashes to where A is, so it acquires the read latch on A, and then T, uh, T2 starts, it wants to do a write, so acquires the write latch on C. And at this point, when T1 starts up again and tries to look at this, it can't run because it can't get that latch, whereas, so it has to stall, whereas um, this other thread can keep going down here. And then now this guy can then pick up and keep going behind it. All right, so then eventually it has to stall too because it can't go here. This guy moves on, does his insert, uh, and then this guy can then proceed. Right, so we can do the exact same optimization that he said, and we'll see this in, in the context of B plus tree. I could just keep taking relatches until I find the spot that I want, and then I try to acquire the relatch that I want. But I do have to handle the case where I, do, I take the relatch, see this is the spot I want to go, then I release the relatch, then come back and try to take the right latch, and in between that time, somebody might have inserted something in my slot, and then I need, then I need to be able to handle that and keep scanning down below. So just, that technique works, but there's extra stuff you have to do. So again, the main takeaway I want you to get from all this, there can't be a deadlock because everyone's scanning from the top to the bottom. That makes our life easier. There's nobody else coming in the other direction. So and that's why also too, we can just release the latches before we jump to the next one because we're not worried about the location of the page we're jumping to changing. Okay? All right, so let's talk about more complicated things. Let's talk about how to do this in a B plus tree. So again, we want to have multiple threads running at the same time. Uh, and they, we allow them to do reads and writes uh, without having to lock the, or latch the entire tree for, for during that duration of the operation. So the two things we need to handle in our B plus tree to make them thread safe is that we need to handle the case where two threads are trying to modify the same node at the same time. And then we need to handle the case where one thread might be traversing the tree and then down below it, before it gets to the leaf node, another thread does a mo modification that causes a split and a merge and now the location of a page may end up, or of a node may end up getting moved around, and the data I'm looking for is not there. Or even worst case scenario, I have a pointer to now an, in memory, an invalid memory location. So let's look at a high level example here. So we're gonna focus on this side of the tree. I'm just labeling them A, B, C, D, E, and then so forth on the leaf nodes. So say we wanna do a, uh, a delete on, on 44, down to the bottom. So the first thread is going to start at the top. Again, we just do the traversal we've talked about so far, where we look at the separator keys, we figure out whether we want to go left and right, and we move down to the child node based on that. So then we need to get down to this leaf node here, and we can go ahead and delete our entry. But now we see that our node is less than half full. In this case, it's entirely empty. So therefore, we have to rebalance. And so we're going to want to, in this case here, instead of doing a merge, we'll just copy over uh, a key from one of our siblings. But let's say before we can do that rebalancing, uh, the OS swaps out our thread, 
all right, and we get stalled, and now another thread is start running. And that other thread wants to do uh, a lookup to, to find key 41, right down here at the bottom. So it does the same thing. It starts traversing the tree, and then it gets down to this point here, and it looks at the separator keys and figures out, oh, I want to go to this node. But then it, get, it the OS stalls this, switches back to our first thread, and the first thread moves 41 over, and then now when my other thread starts up running again, I get down here and the thing that I, that I thought was there is no longer there. Right? So, this, so best case scenario, this is just, you know, we got a false negative here. We thought key, key 41 does exist, but the index told us it didn't exist. That, of all the anomalies or issues we're talking about today, that's the best case scenario. Worst case scenario was this node got moved around and then now this pointer pointed to nothing. And we, we, again, we would get a seg fault and our program would crash. So the way we're going to handle this is the classic technique called latch crabbing or latch coupling. When I, you know, when I was a young lad, when I was taught databases, uh, I, they gave me, I was told the term was called latch crabbing. I don't know what the textbook actually uses, but the Wikipedia, I think, calls it latch coupling. It's all the same concept, same thing. So latch crabbing is a technique that allows some multiple threads to access the, the B plus tree at the same time, and we're going to protect things using latches. So the basic idea of the way this works is that anytime we're at a node, we have to have a latch on that node. It could be in, in, in write mode or read mode. And then before we can jump to our child, we got to get the latch on our child, the next, the next node we're going we're gonna to go to. And then when we land on that, on that child, we can then examine its contents. And if we determine that the child node we just moved to is safe, then it's OK for us to release the latch on our parent. And so the term latch crabbing sort of has to do with the way like crabs walk, like moving one leg past another. That's how we're going to acquire our latches as we go down. So our definition of safe is one where if we're doing a modification, the, the node we're sitting at will not have to do a split or merge no matter what happens below it in the tree. So that means that it's either not completely full if we're trying to do an insert, we have room to accommodate any key that may come up to us or any, any key that we're inserting. And then if we're doing a delete, we know that it's more, it's more than half full. Meaning if we, have, if we have to delete a key, we're not going to have to do a merge. Right, so again, the basic protocol works like this. At the very root, you, you acquire the right latch you need. So in the case we're doing a find, it's all relatches all the way down. Again, every single time we, we get to the next node, we, we release the latch on our parent node, where we came from. Because again, we're not making any modifications, so every, every node is deemed safe. For inserts and deletes, we, we start off with getting right latches all the way down, and then as soon as we recognize that the node we're at is considered safe, we can release any right latch we have up above in the tree. Because again, no matter what happens below us, they will not be affected. They will not have to get changed. So let's look at some examples. So again, find is, is super simple. I want to find key 38 at the bottom. So my thread starts off at the beginning. I get the relatch on A. I come down to now B, and now this point here, again, because it's a read-only operation, it's a find, it's safe for me to release the latch on A. So as soon as I get down to B, I can release the latch on A, and I'm good to go. And now I keep scanning down and do the same thing, get to D, release on B, get to H, release on D. And now I do my read, and, and I'm done. Right? Pretty straightforward. So let's see now if we want to do a, a delete. So I start off with the right latch on the root. I come down to B after I acquire the right latch. Now at this point here, is it, is it safe for me to release the latch on A? No, why? Because I only have one key in B, and so I don't know what's below me yet. I'm going down, I'm, going, I'm doing 38, so I'm going down here. I don't know what these other nodes look like yet. So if I do a delete, and I have to, or a merge, and I have to remove this key, now I have to, do, I have to you know, make a change up to A. So in this case here, we, we, we have to hold the latch on B. I'm sorry, hold the latch on A. So then we get the latch on D, get down here, and now we recognize that no matter what, what happens below D, we know that we have room to accommodate, or we can, we can at least delete one key and not have to merge. So we can, at this point here, we can release the latches on, on A and B. So essentially the thread is just sort of keeping a stack of like, here's all the latches I'm, I'm holding as I go down, so it knows at some point when, I, when I'm at a safe node, I just release everything up above me. All right, so now I get down to H. I can release the latch on D because H is 100% is, is full. And then I go ahead and do my delete. And then when I'm done, then I release the latch and I go home. 
So let's see now an insert, same thing. Start with the right latch on A in the root, go down to B. At this point here, I recognize that B can accommodate any new insertion, so it's safe for me to release the latch on A. So I'll go ahead and do that. And then I go down to D. D is considered full, so I don't know what's going to happen below me, and so I have to hold the latch on B. So then I get down to I, and now I recognize that I can never split because it has enough room. So before I do the update, I release the latch on B and, B and D. And then I, then I can do my insert. So for this, the, the order in which you release the latches doesn't matter from a correctness standpoint, right? So back, going back here, I have to release the latch on D and B. If I release the latch on D before B, that doesn't matter because no one's going to get to D anyway because they can't get through B. So from a correctness standpoint, it doesn't matter. But from a performance standpoint, we obviously want to release this one first because this, this covers you know, more, more leaf nodes. So you want to release the higher up latches as soon as possible. Okay. Let's look at one more example where there could be a split. So I, I want to insert 25. Same thing, right latch on, on A, right latch on B. B won't, won't get over full. I can release the latch on A. I come down to C. C is not going to get over full, so I can release the latch on B. But then now I come down to F, and now I see I need, I need to do a split. So in this case here, I need, I need to hold the latch on my parent node on C while I make the change. So I first insert 25 here, take the spillover uh, page over here, put 31 there, and then update my, my parent node. Do I need to have a latch on this new, new guy down here? What's that? He says no. Why? He says nobody can access it because you can have you have a latch on the parent. That assumes that there's no sibling pointers, which we'll talk about in a second. So in this example here, for, for simplicity reasons, I'm not going to acquire the latch because everyone's going top to the bottom. If I'm scanning along the leaf nodes, then yes, someone can get to this, and I have to protect it. But we'll get to that. Okay? Yes. His statement is, I said that the threads have a stack of the, uh, of the latches that they're acquiring as they go down. Shouldn't it be a queue? Yes. First in, first out. Okay, yes. Yeah. Uh, when we are talking about locking, we used, used to say that we release the lock that we first acquire, like release in the reverse order of the acquiring lock. In like OS. Yes. But in releasing the latches, we release the most highest latch, which is the first action we put at that cross latch. So, so his, his qu statement is, I said, uh, going back to this example here, I said that you want to release the latches in the, from the top to the bottom. Yeah. And you're saying in the OS world, you, you, you release them in, the in reverse order. So again, think about what we're doing in the data structure here. At this point here, like no one can get to D unless they go through B. So me releasing the latch on D doesn't do anything. Because nobody's waiting to get that latch. Up, somebody up above could be waiting to get to acquire B. So I want to release that latch as soon as possible. So it, because we know what the data structure, how it's being used, and we understand the context of how the latches are being used, we want to release this one first. Okay? Okay. So now I want to ask you guys, what was the very first step I did for all those modification examples, for the inserts and deletes? What's the very first step you do? You latch the root. Exactly. You latch the root in exclusive mode or write, write mode. That's problematic, right? Because again, the right, lock, right latch is exclusive. No other thread can, can acquire any other latch at, during that, on that node. So this becomes a single point of contention, a single bottleneck. In order to get into the, the, that, the data structure, Everyone has to acquire this right latch, and only one thread can hold that right latch at a time. So this is a big problem. This is, this is going to prevent us from getting high parallelism and high concurrency. So we need a, something better than uh, just everyone acquiring the right latch as soon as they go in. And so what we're gonna actually going to do is exactly what he proposed before for the hash table, is make an optimistic assumption that most 
threads are not going to need to do splits or merges at the leaf nodes. So rather than taking right latches all the way down, I take read latches all the way down, and then I take a right latch on the leaf node. If I determine that I don't have to split, then great, I got down with just read latches, and I can make whatever change that I want. If I, if I get it wrong, and I do have to do a split or merge, then I just abort, restart the operation from the beginning, and take right latches down. So this is, a, this is a standard technique we do in systems where you sort of optimistic versus pessimistic. I'm optimistically going to assume that I'm not going to have to do a split. So therefore, I take the fast path and do, do read latches. We'll see this in context of other things like for transactions later on. Um, and for most data structures, or most B plus trees in the real world, this is actually a, a pretty safe assumption. Right? In my examples, I'm showing nodes that have two keys in them. In a real database system, your node is going to be you know, 8 kilobytes or 16 kilobytes. That's going to have a lot of keys. So most of the operations you're doing are not going to have to do a split and a merge. In the rare case that you do have to do a split and merge, then again, you just fall back to the standard latch crabbing technique that I showed before. So this is from a paper from 1977 uh, from these German guys, Bear and Schlocknick. So th th there's no name for the algorithm. I think people usually just refer to it as the Bear Schlocknick algorithm or optimistic lat latch crabbing. All right, so let's say again, we want to do that delete on 38. So again, I don't take a right latch from the root. I take a read latch all the way down. And then when I get down to, uh, to D here, I acquire the, read la the right latch on, on, on H. I recognize that I'm doing a d delete. Therefore, I'm not going to do a split and merge. So therefore, my, my gamble paid off. And I don't need to, to restart. Right? I can do my delete uh, without having to take right latches. Right? Same thing for insert. So insert 25. Uh, I take the relatch on the way down. Oops, sorry. I take a relatch uh, and do crabbing all the way down. And then I eventually get to C here, where I take the, the right latch on F. This one, I recognize that I'm going to have to do a split. So I abort the operation and just restart it. Start from the beginning and take, take right latches all the way down. Shouldn't you start from the point like where you last? Uh, release the latches. Like, so he said, shouldn't you start at the point where you last release the latches on the way down? So that would be, in this case here, C, right? It's like, say, B had two nodes, and then C had only one. In this case, so you have to take on all A, B, and C. So your question is, so... If B had two nodes... Then if B had two... Sorry, if, what do you mean by two nodes? Like two siblings? Sorry, two, two, two keys. Two keys yeah. Yes? So then when we come at B, we release A, right? Correct, yes. So then when we go to C, we get C, and then we go to F, we get C and F. So once you restart, you should only really get C and F. But how do, you get, how do you get C and F again? You maintain a stack of the pointers that you go through, right? But you can't. He said, he said you can maintain a stack of the pointers where you got down here. I can't do that because, again, say page IDs. Again, the, these, these A, B, C, D, E, these are the logical identifiers for these nodes. But they may end up being put into different pages. So because I, didn't, I don't hold any latches on these things, anybody can do anything. And therefore, the location of the page ID for these, these nodes may now be something different. So if now it used to be page 123, now it's 456. In my stack, I go look for page 123, and now it's something completely different. Because I can't, can't assume that the location of these nodes will always be the same unless I hold a latch on them. The read latch prevents anybody from writing them and doing any splits. The write latch prevents anybody from mod el also modifying them. So you always have to restart. Yes? So it could be possible that initially we thought we needed to do a split, but then we tried to acquire the write blocks again. Now write latch, but keep going. Uh, write, uh, write latches again, and then we saw that we don't need to do that anymore because some process between those two steps did something else, right? So, so you. You, so your statement is, um, yes, say it from the beginning. So if I assume that, yes, just start over, sorry. Um, we assumed in the beginning that we would need to split, so we acquired the right latch. Yes. But then we saw we no longer need to do it now, because in, while we were trying to acquire those right latches, some other uh, thread changed the uh, structure of the back So your question is, if we're, ha if, say we're like, maybe like here. So... I hold the read latch on this, and I hold the right latch on this, and then, because I, at this point, I need, I need to modify it, 
but also I don't know whether someone's going to change the change something that would cause this thing to get modified as well. Yeah. But again, everyone's going the same direction, so they can't do that. Like they can't get to they can't make any change here because I hold the relatch on that, so they can't modify this node, right? Yes. Uh, when you are inserting twenty-five, yes, you get down to the bottom and you hold the uh, like insert twenty-five. Yeah. When you get down to the bottom and you hold the red latch on the lead node, yes. when you want to start from the root, you release this latch. Yeah, the question is, in this example here, when I got down here and took the right latch on F to do the insert, and when I recognize, oh, I got a split, therefore I need the right latch on this, and, there, and I don't have it, so I have to restart, do you just hold this the whole time? No. Then if, if you're like insert 24 and then insert 25, yes. So when you insert it on your you get down to the F node. Yes. You, you identify that you need to split. But then the insert of 25 is already at B. So when you release the red lock and the, uh, before you get the red lock of the root, the insert 25 comes down to the bottom. Yes. And recognize that it also needs to split. Yes. So that comes to the situation that he described. The insert 24 will uh, get the red lock and go down through the root and then split F. Yes. When the insert 25 comes down, it is okay. Uh, yes. So, all right, so rephrase what she said. So say I had this example here. I want to insert 25. I got to the leaf node and recognize, oh, I got a split. Let me restart and take right latches down. But in between the time I restarted, Somebody else came along and wants to insert 24, and they're going to have the same issue. They also have to split this. So they come back as well and take, take right latches on the way down. But now, because both of them are taking right latches, only one of them is going to proceed at a time. So now 25, say the guy that wants to insert 25, he gets there first. He inserts this and splits. Then 24 is allowed to run. It gets down here. It doesn't care that it already got split. Again, this is a good example between the logical correctness and, and, and the, the logical view and the physical view. I don't care in my index where my key actually exists. So I don't care that like, oh, I try to put it here, so make sure I put it in here the next time because I couldn't do it the first time. I want to go exactly this page. You don't care. Every single time you come into it, you're doing this traversal from scratch. You don't care how you got there before. So it doesn't matter that 25 inserts here, it splits, or maybe 24 came first and splits. It doesn't matter. It's still balanced and still correct. Yes. So like a second traversal, we are getting right latches when we don't actually need them. Correct. So he said the second traversal for 24, yeah. it doesn't need a right latch because 25 already split it. Mm -hmm. Correct. That, so that, that's more expensive, but what's the alternative, right? Yeah. The alternative is to take right latches every single time. So optimistic is not perfect. We're not guaranteed to always do the least amount of work we need to do. Because certainly if I'm, if, again, in this case here, my nodes are really small, so I'm splitting an, an, a lot if I'm inserting a lot. So I'd be wasting a lot of, a lot of cycles, a lot doing wasted work to reverse just to find out I need to come back and take right latches. So in practice, if the contention rate is high and therefore the optimistic assumption is incorrect, you're, gonna, you're actually going to be slower than just doing the pessimistic thing. But for the, these data structures in general, for, for, for what we're talking about here, the optimistic one actually works the best. The, for the, the hash table stuff, I actually haven't seen numbers in that case, the, it's oftentimes the, 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 the pessimistic approach of taking latches on the page is, is actually pretty good because it's so simple. For this one, we can be more fine-grained and, and, and we get a big win. But it depends on a lot of things. It depends on what the workload is. Are we insert heavy, lookup heavy, delete heavy? Uh, it depends on you know, the distribution of our values. It depends on how many cores we have. Right? It, it, it varies a lot. In practice, though, most database systems just pick one approach. They don't try to be adaptive because, it's, it's, it, from an engineering standpoint, it's way more complicated. Yes. Uh, we cannot use uh, slot uh, latches in B plus C, right? It's only the pages that we latch. So he says uh, for B plus C nodes, you can't use the low-level slot latches uh, like you can in a in a page table. No, because you could be modifying the um, you could be modifying the again the physical structure of, of the index itself. So therefore, I'm updating pointers. 
So like if I have like like if I need to do a split and merge, and I I'm, I need to have latches for all the keys in this in this node in order to, to move them around. So so in general, you just take a latch on the entire page. I think that's true. I could double check that though. It makes things more complicated. Okay. So again, this this is just to reiterate what we we've already talked about. Uh, Again, for the for this for the search with the better the better lock, latch, uh, latching algorithm, same as before. Insert, delete. It's it's again you, you take relatches on the way down. If you, if it fails, then you just come back and restart. So again, this is what I was saying before about how we're assuming that most of the time taking the relatches on the way down is going to be good enough. We're not going to have to restart, right? And therefore, if we if we if we if we choose correctly, we predict cor incorrectly, then that first time we went down is just wasted work. We're just burning cycles. And so we're not going to get the, the better scalability or concurrency we may actually want. But I'll say in practice, this, is, this, is, this usually works out nicely. All right. So the next thing to talk about is how we actually support leaf node scans. So in the example I've shown so far with the B plus tree, just like in the hash table, all the traversals were in one direction. They always top to the bottom. So there can never be any deadlocks because I never had a thread trying to come up from the bottom to the top in reverse direction and try to hold latches that holds latches that another thread wants, right? So if though now we want to start scanning on leaf nodes, things become more complicated because now we have things coming from top to bottom and, and also from left to right. And so in this case, deadlocks could occur. So let's see how we handle this. So the first thing I'll say is, is the original, I said this before, the original B plus tree did not have these sibling pointers on the leaf nodes. This is what, how most B plus trees have this now, and this comes from the B link tree that was invented here at CMEO. So let's say uh, I have this really simple tree like this, and I have thread one wants to find all keys less than four. So we take a read latch on the root, come down here after we get the read latch on, on C, we can release the read latch on A, and now we want to start scanning, scanning across. Right? So say we, we reverse order on all the keys in this node, but now we recognize that we got to keep going over here. right? So just like before, in the case of crabbing, when we want to go uh, horizontally, we don't release the latch that we hold until we acquire the latch that we want. So in this case here, I, in order to get the latch on B, I hold the latch on C. Once I acquire it, then I can swing around and then release the latch on, on C. So in this case here, for all keys less than four, it's basically keys from less than four to negative infinity. So we know that we're going to have to hit the you know, we want to get to the, this end of the, of, the, of the tree. There's other tricks you can do, like having like fence keys or hint keys, basically to tell you for this node here, what's the keys over on this side here to tell you whether you even, even need to jump there or not. But for this example, we don't need to worry about that. All right, so let's make it more complicated. Let's say now we have another, another thread that wants to find all keys greater than one. Well, okay, that's fine. So both of them start. They both want to acquire the read latch on A. That can happen because that, that can be shared amongst them. And then they, this guy gets the read latch on B. This guy gets the read latch on C. That's fine. Then they scan all their keys and they start going across. Uh, and for this point here, B wants the latch on C. C wants the latch on B. That could be shared, right? Because the read latches. So at this point here, they both acquire the alternating ones, the different ones. That's good. Then they slide over and now they release the latch that they just came from. So because the read latch can be shared, there's no deadlocks, right? So this works out fine. So let's talk about now when we have, we have writes. So thread one wants to delete four, and thread two wants to find all keys greater than one. So at the very beginning, they, they start off. They can both get the read latch on A, because we're doing that the optimistic latch coupling technique, or latch crabbing, where I... At my root, I always acquire the read latch and only get the, the right latch on, the, on the, uh, the child node. So at the very beginning, they both have a read latch. That's fine. And then they both go down here. B gets the read latch on, on sorry, thread, one gets, thread two gets the read latch on B. Thread one gets the right latch on C, because that's the entry that it wants to delete. So now let's say that uh, T2 wants to scan across, because it's finding all keys greater than one. So before it can jump into, to, into C, it has to get the right latch on C, or sorry, the read latch on C. But it can't do that because 
the first thread has the right latch on this, this node. So what should happen? What's that? He says it should wait. What else could we do? There's three choices, right? We could wait, right? Again, think of that while loop we just spin in that. We could uh, kill ourselves and just restart the operation. Or it could, be, it could be like a gangster and try to steal its, you know, take go over here, kill, shoot it in the head, take its wallet, take its lash, and then take over. <laughs> All right, so raise your hand if you think we should wait. 25%. Raise your hand if you think we should just kill ourselves. Even less. Raise your hand if, if you think we should be a gangster and steal it. Nobody. So, what's the issue here? What what does this thread know about this thread? Nothing. Right? Because all the latch is just, just little some bits in the data structure, this, and then someone someone acquires it in, in either read mode or write mode. So there's no global view in the system to tell you what this other thread is doing. The database system at a high level, sure, it says no, I'm doing I'm doing delete on four. But at this lowest level inside the data structure, as our threads are traversing through, we don't have access to that information because that would be too expensive for us to go look up. Again, we want these operations to be really fast because we're holding this latch on this guy here you know, while we're trying to get that other latch. So we could wait, but that could be a bad idea too because we don't know what this guy's doing. Right? We don't know whether, you know, in this case here, in our example, it's just deleting this one record, this one key, and, it, and then, then it's done. But we don't know that. It could also be trying to acquire the latch on B, and therefore I have a deadlock. So the simplest thing turns out to be the best thing is just we say we don't want to live anymore, and we just abort and kill ourselves, and just restart the operation. Right? This is the fastest thing to do because there's, again, these, these latches are super dumb. Like there's no information about who, who's holding them and what they're doing. So rather than try to reason about anything, we just want to immediately stop what we're doing and restart. And, and assume that the time we come back, then the latch we want is now there. Yes? Uh, how is that better than waiting? He says, how is it better than waiting? So yeah, you could wait a little bit with a timeout, and then if, eventually if that, the latch you want is not available, then you just kill yourself. That's a, you, you could do that as well. But like, I'm talking like maybe wait microseconds. If you are trying to like uh, get a lock on the that uh, left side, then would you already have a right lock on the parent? So there can never be a dead lock. So his statement is back up here. He said if if we're we're down here on C for thread one, doesn't thread one have a right latch? If he wants to change B also, then he will have a right latch, right? Because uh, he knows that he requires a right latch, so it will go again from the top and get the right latches. And so it will have a right latch on the parent. So in this case, uh, that blue thread can't have a read latch, so there cannot be a red So his statement is that if, if C really wanted to go in this direction and, and do some modification, wouldn't it have to have a right latch up above? And therefore, I... Uh, this thread would not have been able to get down here to, to go across. Well, no, right? So say the blue thread starts first, it gets the read latch, comes down here and gets the read latch that it wants on B, then T1 starts, gets the right latch on, on, on A, right? And then gets the right latch on this. So it doesn't know. You don't know this. Like it can come in any order. Yes? No. Here, but are, are we just ignoring that? Like, theoretically, the, the read could like keep on restarting if you have a lot of other. Yeah. So his statement is, which is true, we could have starvation here, where this thing here says, "I don't, you know, I can't get what I want. I'm going to kill myself." Tries it again, same issue. Yes. And there's different ways to handle that. That adds additional overhead. Um, in practice. Uh, I don't think MySQL and Postgres do anything. I don't know what the commercial guys. But you can do it. You can imagine how to do it. It's just it's extra work, and it may not be worth it. The simple thing might be the best thing. Yes. Uh, what do you mean by the whole program? Uh, like the process? Oh no 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 no! Like 
it's like so it's like when I, so like an operation. So this like find all keys greater than one. We restart that. Okay, good, good. Actually, so is that, um, actually perfect. Next, the next slide. So the the way to think about this is that we have this database system. We have this execution engine that's invoking queries, and it says, oh, in order to get the tuples I need for this query to enter this query, I got to go to the index and do find all keys greater than one. So then it invokes that on the index, and then there's basically a retry loop that's inside the index where I keep retrying that to do that operation on that index until it succeeds. For, for inserts or things that could potentially violate an integrity constraint, yeah, you have a check to say, you know, I tried to insert and I couldn't because it would violate the integrity constraint, not because I couldn't get the latch I wanted. And in that case, you, you abort that up, you abort that operation. But in general, you just keep retrying this forever because eventually it'll go through. But to his point, you could lead to starvation or just burning a lot of cycles, trying to you know, traverse to the bottom and then try to acquire the latch that you're never gonna acquire. But the main thing, I, the main takeaway I want to get, at, get out of this is that because this, there's a potential for deadlock here, but we don't know there, what the other thread's doing, rat, we want to be super conservative and just kill ourselves immediately. We can wait a little bit, sure, but we don't want to reason about what they're trying to do. We just say we can't get this latch and immediately retry. Because there's nothing else up above that's going to say, oh, there's a deadlock, let me break, break it by killing one of you. Yes? Uh, wouldn't it matter uh, the kind of latch the other thread is having? So the statement is, it wouldn't matter what, that, what kind of latch the other thread is having? Sure, yes. In this case here, it's, this guy has a right latch, I can't, I can't get the read latch, so that fails. Yeah, so I was thinking, say, uh, the other thread, C, T2 has uh, the read latch. Then should we kill, uh, even right, so that was the gangster one, right? So that was saying, like, this guy has the read latch. Maybe I prefer read, right, reads over writes, and therefore I want to kill this guy. Sure, you can do that, but how do you actually implement that in your code? Now you need a way to interrupt this guy in whatever it's doing to then go steal the latch. That's super hard because, again, we're, we're doing this, these small critical sections. I don't want to check a global variable that says, did somebody hate me and I, and I should die? Right? <laughs> So having to coordinate that is just, it's not worth it. In the back, yes? Uh, I just have a dating question. So in this um, scenario, if I perform a write on C, um, and that requires a split on C, which requires me to edit the node for parent Anyway, uh -huh. I have to go all the way back up and acquire a write latch on the parent after the read latch is gone? OK, so I think you said here, if, if this thing actually, when I do the delete, I have to I have to merge and if I have to modify the root, yeah. how would that work? Yeah. Well, again, like I would have to have the right. So when I landed here using optimistic latch crabbing, I would recognize, oh, I'm going to have to merge and modify my parent. So I got to go back and take exclusive latches all the way, exclusive latches all the way down. Okay. So that, that gets handled. Yes? Can we avoid this issue if we, like, whenever we get a lock, whenever we decide that we're going to not unlock the parent, we just lock all of the children, not just the one we're going to modify. If so, we're like right above a leaf or something like that. Say it again. If, 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 say it again. If, if we're in this situation here. So like we're in this situation here, let's say we're going to split or whatever. Yeah. Right? So we have we maintain our right latch on A. Yes. Right? And we say, okay, we're going to do some operations that require us to modify A. So we just obtain locks on all of the children of A because we know that A is a parent of leaves. And so then we never actually get start the read operation on B. And so then we then wait for that to finish and then the read lock starts and then we never have to worry about this like uh, deadlock. Yeah, so he's actually correct. So so this is what's that? There will be a deadlock in what he just said. Like say if the blue thread came first, then A is trying to acquire all the children locks and blue thread is acquiring the lock of that child. So there will be a deadlock. <laughs> right. So all right, so let me, let me try to distill what you're saying. So if I, if I know I need to do a split in here, and therefore I may have to spill over here, I want to acquire a right latch on this, and then a, and then a right latch from all, all my all its children, yeah. and then that would allow me to do any modifications that I want to do, which includes updating the sibling pointers, which, which is tricky. Um, and then you're saying that could cause a deadlock because someone could be coming in a different direction. Yeah. And so, uh, the blue one already has a lock on B. Now, uh, what he said, you have a lock on A and C, and you want to acquire a lock on B. Yes. So now the blue one wants to acquire a lock on C, and he wants to acquire a lock on B. So there will be a record. Right, so you kill yourself. 
There's no point in requiring locks. Um, no, so if this guy had a split, I have to update the sibling pointer too. So you do, you do need to acquire a latch on this guy as well. But again, the simplest thing is like, I, another thing you can do to like say two threads at the exact same time to require the exact same latches. In practice, there's, you know, there's enough, they're not gonna be in, in absolute lockstep, meaning like if you abort them at the same time, they'll immediately come back and hit the same conflict. They're gonna be slightly different from each other. But even then you could say, all right, I've tried this before and I, and I wasn't able to do it. Let me back off a little bit. And that way I at least come in staggered. And then I avoid that issue. Again, the simplest thing is to say, I didn't get the lash that I wanted to kill myself immediately. And that avoids all deadlocks. And that's gonna be different than when we talk about two-phase locking later on for transactions, because we will we'll have something else can come and resolve deadlocks for us, but we don't have that here. Okay, so the last thing I want to I want to finish up discussing is a uh, is an additional optimization for handing overflows, and this and this is, this comes from the B link again. The B link tree is what 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 first invented the the sibling pointers, and then everybody does that now in a B plus tree for the most part, at least in one direction. So. Normally, every time we have to do an overflow, we have to do a split in a node, we have to update three nodes. We have to update the, the node being split, we have to create a new node to, to overflow into, and then we have to update at least one parent or in, our, in our ancestry to now accommodate that new separator key for the, the new node that we added. So the B-link tree guys came with optimization where any single time a leaf node overflows, you actually hold off on, on updating the parent node so that you don't have to restart and uh, the, restart the traversal and do the pessimistic right latches all the way down. You just update a little global information uh, global information table for the for the tree and says, anytime somebody comes through that part of the tree again, here's how I want you to update it. So let's look at an example. So say I want to insert key 25. Again, I do the optimistic latch crabbing on the way down. I get read latches. Uh, I get to here on C. Again, I'm, I'm, when I get the right latch on, on F, I, here's that I would recognize that I'm going to have to split. But then rather than restarting and taking right latches, I just give up the read latch on C. I still do my insert uh, and add the new, the, new, uh, the new node. But then rather than having to update this thing, I just have a little uh, global, global table for the tree that says, if you, if, you, if you ever take the right latch on this node C, here's the change I want you, I want you to add in, right? And that way, the next time somebody comes through and takes the right latch, they'll do some extra work and, and, and finish updating uh, what we wanted. And this is still correct. This is still valid. Because if I come along and now do a lookup on 31, well, I follow the, the, the pointers down, and my pointer for, for all keys greater than 23 will put me here. And now I have to know, all right, well, I actually have this overflow thing. If I'm looking for 31, scan along the leaf node, and that's actually what I'm looking for. Yes? Right, so basically, so now there's, now there's, a, there's a, again, this global thing that anybody can see when they first start. It says, oh, by the way, if, you, if, you're, if, you're, if you're doing a modification and you're going by C, take a right latch for it. So this guy wants to now insert 33. I can do re-latches all the way down to get to B. And then, but now for C, I, I would know, oh, well, I was told that I should take a right latch on this. Let me go ahead and do that. Now I, I, do, I finish the propagation of applying that change there. And then now the tree is considered, considered valid. Right, and take the right latch and complete my operation. So it's just, it's like, rather than having to do the restart, you update this thing to say, all right, the next time you go through, somebody else will take care of it for me. Yes? So how would you usually identify C? How would you identify C? What do you mean? Like, like, how, like it's a page ID, right? Or a logical node ID. If you're going to see, you know, page one, two, three, by the way, apply this change for me. Yes? Do you update what, sorry? So back here, yeah, so, 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 yeah. Yes, I'm, I'm, for simplicity reasons, there's different ways to do this. In this case here, if, if we don't have the same parent, uh, then we may not have a sibling pointer to go in the reverse direction. 
uh, there's different implementations, but if you want to have bi-directional sibling pointers, yes, you'd have to update that. That makes things way more complicated than what I could show in a, in a class. And when you get the link from uh, the C to uh, our overflow, you need to update uh, the overflow link as well? Uh, what, like this thing? Yeah. Well, that's just a sibling pointer. Right, yeah, you, uh, you, you, need, you, have, you have to update and say, yes, the sibling pointer, the, the overflow thing is not there anymore. But it actually doesn't matter anymore, actually. You actually can keep it, right? Because up above, if I'm looking for things uh, greater, greater than or equal to 31, I'm never going to get this node anyway. I'd always get to this one. So you don't, you don't actually have to update it. Yes? So we know that C won't be changed because the first writer to C will update this value, right? Otherwise, like when I previously asked, you said that C can be changed by other people also. But the first person who will change C will do this update. Correct. His statement is the first person for this, for this particular optimization, the first person that will update C applies this change. And because they hold the right latch on it, it's an atomic operation. Otherwise, like, uh, it could have been changed. Correct, yes. Otherwise, it could be changed, yes. OK, awesome. All right, so let's finish up. Uh, so hopefully, I've convinced you that uh, you, you, know, you want to do the, this latching stuff, uh, but it's notoriously hard to do. Right? I glossed over the sibling pointers, how to keep those in, in sync. That's a whole other uh, uh, bag of we don't want to talk about. It. That's super tricky. Um, but again, as I said, the good news is that because it's super hard, and if you can do this, people pay you a lot of money to do this. Uh, in practice, I would say that you know there's there are there's actually surprisingly I mean there's there's a bunch of concurrent data structure uh, libraries that are out there. The Intel thread building blocks is one of them. Facebook's Folly. Uh, so in general, for low-level things like you know internal hash tables and things like that that aren't being used as part of doing query processing and storing data as an index, off-the-shelf stuff is probably good enough. All the commercial systems roll, all the high-end systems roll their own data structures for these things. But for table indexes, I think that having the, having building a data structure that's specific to your database system is super important because then you can tailor it towards whatever the, whatever your target operating environment is. So the other thing I'll point out too is although we talked a little bit, a little bit about hash tables, we spent most of our time talking about B plus trees. But the core ideas that I've talked about, like making sure threads are always going in one direction to avoid deadlocks, killing yourself right away if you do encounter a deadlock, um, maybe optimistically uh, assuming that you're not going to have have to do modifications to to the structure, and therefore taking a fast path first. All these techniques are, are reused all throughout computer science and and, data, and systems in general. So it's not just B plus trees. These techniques are, are applicable everywhere. Okay. All right. So any questions about about what we talked about so far today? All right. So the good news is that next class we can we can finally start talking about how to execute queries. We know how to store them. We know how to index them. And now let's talk about actually how do you you know run queries on top of them and produce results. Okay. All right, guys. Have a good weekend. See ya. Oh dear, coming through with my shell and poo. Two cent for a case, give me St. Nas poo. In the midst of broken bottles and crushed up can. Met the cows in the jam, oh how dry I am. With St. Nas in my system, crack another, I'm blessed. Let's go get the next one and get over. The object is to stay sober, lay on the sofa. Better yet, down my sofa. Who be the be stressed out, could never be sun. Rick is a jelly, hit the deli for a cold one. Naturally blessed, yes, my rap is like a laser beam. The boards in the bushes, St. Nas in the canteen. Crack the bottle of the St. I sip it through those who don't realize the drinking ain't only to be drunk. You can't drive, keep my people still alive. And if the same don't know you from a can of paint, paint.